Welcome back, fellow spy fans. Today we're talking about episode three of The Night Manager. If uh, you haven't heard our last couple episodes and want to catch up, um, go back and listen to episode one and two. But if you just kind of want to follow along, uh, a quick synopsis of the story, where our main character, Christopher Pine, stumbles on some information about an international arms deal and is recruited by British intelligence officer Angela Burr to take down the arms dealer, Richard Roper, played by Hugh Laurie. And um, last time, uh, we had Pine kind of uh, risk his life to uh, save the son of Richard Roper on some botched kidnapping that turned out to be planned by Burr and Pine. Um, And the last thing we saw was uh, Roper talking to Pine and talking about how uh, we're going to find out who you are. So we kind of get to see that in this episode where there's kind of like a face-off interrogation with Roper and Pine. And I think Corky was there too. Um, It was nice to kind of see that because we had to watch kind of Pine defend himself. Do you think, do you think he defended himself well? Well, he doesn't, I mean, he does in, in the sense that he doesn't especially try, you know, I mean, he just, you know, he sticks, he sticks to, I'd like to leave now, yeah. um, which I like, I think he, he maybe could have been a little more persistent about it, but maybe it would have just dragged the story out too much. Like I said, uh, last week, you know, if he was really sticking to his guns as like second worst man in the world, mm. uh, I think he'd be asking for a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's right. You did say that. He was like, "I'm not asking for anything. I just want to go. Thank you for taking care of me, but I'm I'm out." Um, I, I like I like I liked a lot that he stuck to his story. I think it really helped. But yeah, you're right. Uh, he probably should have asked for some money. But anyway, um, Roper kind of pitches the idea of working with him and keeps him on the island. Uh, he's just not allowed to contact anybody outside. So to try and get out, because Angela's like panicking and doesn't know if he's okay or not, he asks Roper to take out the son to town, I guess across the ocean or whatever, um, so that he can get out there, knowing that they're probably watching the island. And um, I thought this was clever. Uh, it was a way to make contact with Angela, or at least show that, hey, I'm alive. Um but he talks Danny into getting some ice cream and she's like pretending to be like some tourist. And he kind of is talking to Danny, but really sending information Angela's way, you know, like, Oh, well, who's going to be at the party tonight. And, you know, I don't think Corky likes me very much. I don't know. He's looked into like my whole past all the way to ancient Egypt, you know, so he's kind of letting Angela know, Hey, this guy is right in my ass. I thought that was really clever. Um, you know, and it's because the uh, Roper would only let him take him to town with the two guards. So they're kind of watching. But, you know, Angela's playing the, the you know, aloof kind of t- tourist while he's like kind of having this side conversation with Danny that's actually giving her info. Um, so I, I, I kind of was I thought it was clever because it was just like, hey, we're going to go get ice cream. The guards, the bodyguards probably don't want any, you know, they're just tough guys watching this stuff or whatever. It's uh, one of I, the I, more I thought, I thought it was it's cool. one of the more definitely one of the more interesting uh, means of passing information uh, between two people that we've seen Uh, definitely plus by points for Hiddleston for recognizing the opportunity and, uh, and, and thinking on his feet uh, about, you know, again, asking about who's going to be at the party uh, using the names, especially using the name major Corcoran and, and talking about how he, really seems to want to know everything about me going all the way back to the ancient Egyptians, which is a slightly strained line. Right. But it would definitely, I mean, it just gets a laugh out of the kid. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, if he was, if he was using that as an, uh, on an adult, I, I think the adult might've keyed it. Like, that's a weird thing to say, but uh, right. what he's, what he's referencing is, is Cairo. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um. I uh, also really liked when they go, what are they like, skipping rocks? Or are they just throwing rocks into the water? You know, I, I don't know why that kind of annoyed me because I love yeah. skipping rocks. Yeah. And just throwing <laughs> rocks into the water is like, I don't know. Yeah. 
<laughs> but uh, I, I liked how he was talking about the house. He, he elicited information from the kid about how many rooms there are. You know, like Roper's busy all the time. He probably doesn't need to play with you or whatever. And then, you know, you probably know every inch of the house. And he's like, yeah, there's 23 rooms and three kitchens. And there's a secret Roper room. You know, he's got like peppermint hidden in there. Uh, no, I I, I, uh, I really enjoyed how much he elicits out of the kid just right under the bodyguards' noses without like any, without any second thought. It, it seemed like a natural conversation. And I liked how he played it. Um, I don't know. I thought it was cute. It's, it's uh, well, it's well done. Uh, my little note here uh, uh, for some spy advice for for Roper is, uh, you know, maybe it's not the smartest idea to tell your kid that your secret office is filled with candy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you if you really don't want him going in there, yeah. that seems yeah, like the right. worst the worst cover story. Yeah, I just got a lot of books or some. <laughs> old clothes or something yeah something boring that the kid's gonna be like oh whatever yeah <laughs> um but you know that's kind of you know pine plays it cool with the kid and then we kind of uh, also get this scene with a, a friend of roper's and a business acquaintance where they're trying to get like a like a arms deal settled and it's at like a birthday party for his 18th his daughter's 18th birthday makes a whole fuss about her She's the most beautiful girl in the world with his expensive necklace. And then later at the party, they find her hung. I don't think it's implied that she was murdered, but I don't think they really, like, definitively say that she killed herself. But regardless, she's she's dead. And this, like, messes... Uh, the guy's name is Oppo. Uh, and um, this was really well kind of utilized by Angela because, uh, you know... All these big hit, like heavyweight type of international peeps, are being watched by all kinds of different organizations, and they they see that he's distraught. His daughter just kind of died. He goes to the like church every day to kind of confess, and then calls them to say that he has information about an arms deal, and then hangs up. So Angela really kind of I don't know. It was kind of tacky though. I, she, I'm I'm here with the angels. I'm on the good side, you know. It, I, if, if I was like kind of that level of like an international arms dealer, I, I, I feel like I would be like, she's really taking advantage of me. I, I don't really feel that she was really playing on his like guilt. I, I think it was way overdone from her. I don't know. What, what did you think? Well, he's not, I mean, he's not an international arms dealer per se. He's, he's a go between that has kind of picked up on the fact that he's involved in, uh, arms trade and mm -hmm. he's he's shown signs like they've picked up off the grid signs that he's got uh some guilt mm -hmm. to, like some some um he's he's having problems with his conscience about right. this because like he he basically kind of like made a call saying he had information about this stuff and then as they asked his name and he just hung up so he's like you know he's on the fence right uh is is what it looks like to them yeah uh, absolutely so you know her coming in i mean yeah I, you could so she can reasonably spot the there's a vulnerability there there's definitely mm -hmm. something there so making a play on him super smart the tying it to his daughter's suicide that part to me felt kind of tacky and mm -hmm. a little like unearned story-wise but you know if i mean he's he's you know he just lost his daughter and he's right. again like just racked with guilt so i guess that's the right uh play to make um we don't have any reason to think i mean like like she says she says i suspect that if roper you know roper's not your friend yeah and i suspect that if he wasn't in your life she would still be alive we don't have any reason to actually think that um right. i don't think i you know there's a there's a few i mean there's multiple different ways to choose to commit suicide uh hanging yourself at your 18th birthday party is a big fucking middle finger to like everyone around you right like it's it's not subtle <laughs> um, so, and it's something that I would think like, uh, has to be like a lot, 
like that can't just be like, well, she started suspecting that her dad was into something shady. Like that is not, I, I can't think of, I can't get from A to C there, you know, that, uh, I think that's the assumption that she kind of figured stuff out. Cause when she's given the gift, she's got that kind of plastered plastic smile, you know, like the, like the, 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 you know, debutante type of, I hate my life, but I have to have a smile, you know? I, and so, I, I mean, I don't think it was like you said, it's not explicitly tied together, but I think they're implying something. She figured something out and you're right. Like this is a big fuck you to everybody at the party. Like, why are you bringing these men to my birthday? You know? Yeah. I mean, one, one way or the other, I mean, we're, we're that girl took her secrets to the grave. We're not going to find right. out <laughs> right. uh, about this stuff, but that's the way Angela decides to play it, uh, which I could say is iffy, but you know, it, it's, it's working. Right. Hey, you know, I think it was correct to try and flip him. I just kind of felt the, the recruitment was kind of tacky, but whatever. Uh, regardless, the, the the plan is is because Pine has expressed that uh, Corky's up his ass, and Angela's got to kind of stop that from happening because they're probably going to figure out about Cairo. Um, she uses opportunity of recruitment not to like get info on Roper, but to have him get Corky out of the picture, and at the same time, Pine is also undermining Corky. But not like explicitly, like uh, he has these little seeds that he throws out, but it's not like blatant. The one that was really kind of scary, though, was when he just starts talking to Roper about Corky's drinking. And Roper's like, that's an odd thing to say. What, what's it, your business about how much he drinks? And he returns back very quickly with how his dad was killed because he drank too much and let it slip to a prostitute, you know. It was uh, five pints of beer and a promise from a prostitute, and my dad was murdered because of it, you know? So it's it's a believable, like, retort. Like, I'm not just pulling this out of my ass because I'm trying to shut down Corky. I'm just concerned because I'm, like, that type of guy. I know you think I'm that type of guy. I am that type of guy. Let me let me tell you why I'm that type of guy. Little things like this, you know, loose lips sink ships, you know? And I'm looking out for you and myself. This is how I think, you know? Um and uh, it does a number of these little kind of seeds that are planted um, that I, I thought were kind of well done. Um, but I think he took advantage of stuff that the story just handed him. Like, it seems like a lot of people on Roper's team who claims to have this tight ship is like, it's a bunch of people fucking up that Pine kind of takes advantage of, right? Like, you've, you've got Corky who drinks too much and is just talking to, you know, is just like kind of like uh, indiscreet with the people that he's talking to. And then there's that guy, Sandy. We didn't really talk to, about him much, but there's this guy that has a wife and kids. That's one of Roper's guys, but he's like kind of sleeping with the, the nanny, the, the girl that's like the babysitter for the kids. And so the wife is all fucked up and I guess he tells her everything. So the wife is upset and tells Pine about the arms deals. And then Pine kind of like, eases her into the thinking like she should tell Jed who's uh Roper's, you know, baby's mama or whatever. But it's like all of these things, it's like everybody's kind of fucking up, but Roper claims to have this tight ship and Pine just kind of takes advantage of it, which is a good move on Pine's part. But it seems to me the story kind of just keeps handing Angela and Pine these things rather than Angela and Pine actively getting involved. Other than the Apo thing. I don't know. What do you what are your thoughts? Do you think like this was well played from them. It's or? I mean, it's the one thing that stretches a little imagination is that both uh, Angela and Pine independently came up with the same idea to to try to undermine Corky and mm -hmm. and to do it using the same uh, leverage, right? Because they they don't have any means of coordinating this kind of stuff, so. That's just there. And, you know, we hadn't, we're going to later definitely see that uh, uh, Mr. Hollander can't hold his liquor at, right. <laughs> at certain points, but you know, it wasn't, it wasn't strongly established at this point. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was uh, I, I applaud, let's see, I applaud Pine, whose name has changed several times already and oh. is going to change again by the end of this episode. <laughs> right. 
but we'll keep calling him Pine to try to keep it straight. Um, that he establishes a strong backstory for being a teacher teller. Uh, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of wine sloshing around in this crew. And, um, <laughs> you know, if he's hanging out with them, he's going to get offered stuff and he wants to stay sober. You know, right. he does, he doesn't want his judgment clouded at all. And, uh, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, don't, if you're going to go in <laughs> to this crew and be the one person that isn't, uh, partaking, uh, uh-huh. Uh, besides the bodyguards, of course, who right. never like they're 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 total pros, um, right. you know have have a strong reason for it, right? Um, and, and, I think and, I think the story about his dad is a pretty good reason, and it might be true. That's right. another thing too. Uh, yeah, that uh, that because uh, we know that his father was involved in some intelligence operations, um. Uh, military type stuff and uh you know that might that might be there might be the glimmer of truth in that story Mm -hmm. makes sense and that might be why he's so quiet about stuff you know like uh, sandy's wife had said i like you pine you see everything and say nothing and and if if that story about his dad is true that that would explain why he's so quiet about stuff and has the many faces the many persons um one of the things he did elicit from the kid about the secret hideout or room that Roper has, the kid was able to get in because they test the alarm every morning at 11 a.m. And so he waited for that alarm test and, and, and broke into the office. It seems like a little lackluster. Is that like a thing? Like, have you ever heard of anything like that where they test the alarm every day at the right same time? And of course, Roper is conveniently not home. And no one else is but the maid or something. I don't like it. I don't like it. Yeah. I think it's the, I think it's, uh, you know, the job of Tabby or Frisky, the security guys, to go up there once a day and press the button. Right. Or somebody, right? You're not going to test the alarm and make it so anybody could just walk anywhere and not set off the alarm. Yeah. It's, I didn't, it, it was a little dumb. It was silly. But while he's in the office, he gets pictures of the documents and, uh, Uh, Actually, one of the cool things that he did to get info and communicate with Angela, he stole the kid's phone. And the kid was like, where's my phone? He's like, oh, I'm not sure. So the kid just thinks he lost it, which is normal. A kid kid that age, what is he, like five or six or seven, I think we said within that range, he can't – the kid like that is probably going to lose their phone a lot, right? So he took the kid's kid's phone to send messages to Angela because he wasn't allowed to have a phone. Um. So that, that was kind of clever. I'm not sure how long that would last because you would think someone would get suspicious. Like, how did this phone just disappear? Somebody. Yeah, yeah, eventually. Well, I mean, and it's but it's nice. You know, it's it's nice because the kid doesn't want anyone to know that he lost the phone. Like you said, like kids are constantly losing. You know, um, I don't have kids, but I've been around my niece and nephew often enough to, right. to know that, like, you know, they lose something. They come to you. They say, like, ah, I lost it. I I. I don't know what to do. <laughs> and like at, at a certain point, you're like, I'm going to fucking staple this thing to you. So you don't lose it again. Right. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, so, and so at some point, you know, the kid stops telling his parents, like I lost my phone. Right. Um, so yeah, that's clever. I mean, if you're going to steal a phone from anyone on the Island, uh, you know, unless you could have grabbed the nanny's phone somehow right. when she was visiting, maybe that would have been a good one, or maybe one of the staff, right. um, but uh, who's also not going to run to the brass and right. and tell them they lost their right. phone. It's like you're uh, you're the maid or you're the right. cook. Like <laughs> why are why are you bringing this to my attention? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't um, buy your phone. You probably left it on the the ferry on your way here this morning, or something. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. I assume I assume most of the staff is like live in kind of situation. Uh, oh, but let's, well, yeah. Let's talk about let's talk about the app uh, that he uses. Uh, oh, z- zip zip zatter or something. Zitter zatter. Zitter zatter. I think it's supposed to be like a WhatsApp or something like that. Right. Or no. Well, yeah, but also like there's some apps out there where they, they, 
you know, their main selling point is their total encryption and like all your messages right. are like deleted after 24 hours or whatever. Right. I exactly. assume it's one of those. It is, or at least it was <laughs> a fictional app. Guess what, buddy? Uh, somebody made a zitter zatter app uh, just in the last hour while I was uh, rewatching the episode. I downloaded it. Uh, Wait, really? Checked it out. It is literally advertised as like the app from the, you know, from the night manager. Oh, <laughs> that is amazing. I am pulling this up. Okay. So I'm going to, right. Uh, there's only four reviews here. Um, okay. If you open up the app, it says it does nothing right now. Uh -huh. But tell us what you think it should do on Facebook, and you can link to a Facebook group from there. That's as far as I got. But we're, we're gonna we're gonna follow up on this. We'll talk about it next episode. What we find, but like here's the reviews. Um, one guy said this app came out in 2019. Uh, mm -hmm. The most recent, it said, took a while to break the code to get to the functional part of the app. Don't give up! Exclamation point. Um, <laughs> somebody else said some magical, easy to break encryption. This app is great, which I don't understand that the best app ever does exactly what it says it does, which it says it does nothing. <laughs> and the fourth review says mysterious and cool exclamation point. But, um, that's hilarious. Oh my God. This is amazing. Yeah. If anybody, um, we're, I mean, we're probably going to take a look at it, uh, but right. if anybody listening out there, if you if you like these kind of like, do you, there was this one game a long time ago in the 80s uh, called Hacker. Mm -hmm. And it just like when you when you launched the game, it just gave you a C prompt. Like in DOS uh -huh. and nothing else and no instructions, <laughs> but you could start you could just, you know, start typing stuff in there. And like, eventually there was actually like, you know, this whole story and this, this, uh, file system in there that you could engage, you know, you probably type like slash DIR or something to start mm -hmm. and see if that does anything. Um, but yeah, if anybody's super into that kind of shit, uh, like, uh, I know my friend Lon is, I might turn him onto it. Uh, if you figure out that there is a secret to this app. Uh, you know, post it on Facebook. So go ahead and spoil it for everyone. Be the first one to, <laughs> to tell us about it on the Facebook group. Uh, Definitely, but, that'd be a lot of fun. But when we when we come back, uh, probably in a week uh, for episode four of the Night Manager, we will have looked into it at least somewhat. Right. See if you can actually do anything with it. Right. Um. But no, Still that's really totally cute. cool that some fucking fanboy made the shit up. <laughs> I know it's great. I, I, I uh, that was definitely a good find. Um, I'm, I'm like laughing my ass off at all these comments. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I thought it was cool that he, you know, used the kid's phone. Uh, but when he does go into the office uh, to take pictures of the documents, he finds a blonde hair and uh, is found by Jed. You know, um, Roper's kind of main squeeze. And uh, he tells her, he shows her the hair and is like, I found this in the office. You were looking through the documents. You need to be careful. Is that a good idea? It's a bad idea. No, it's not. I, it's not I, a good I idea. I think it's a bad idea. I guess he's Terrible trying idea. to see if he could find friends. And he's like, oh, well, she fucked up. But it's still pretty. I think it's a bad idea. I don't think it was a good move. He's letting her know that he's more than he appears. Now, right. whether or not that means I'm more than I appear and I'm secretly working for your boyfriend mm -hmm. and and keeping track of you in ways mm -hmm. that are not pleasant or something else. But no, it's bad. It's bad. Yeah. <laughs> finding finding the hair was nice because, you know, I like the way like, you know, as he's leaving, he's pushing everything back into place and he's taking a last minute, very close check of the desk is everything exactly the way it looked when I got here? Mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, that's just, that's just smart uh, storytelling. Yeah, no, it's very you know, good snooping. Very much attention to detail. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, don't, I don't, I didn't like the, found your hair. Be careful next time. You know, I don't know. 
But I he should have found some pep. He should have found some peppermints in there. I know, right? Well, he found her mints. Like there was like Altoids containers in her drawer, <laughs> but it well, wasn't yeah. in the office. <laughs> I think no. When I looked, I think those are peppermints, and uh, so that's where he hides the key. And also, like in his grandiose speech about like being a self-made man, you know the way he chooses to describe or being a free man is yeah. like I'm free to lie around in bed all day eating peppermints and no one can uh, tell me how to do it. Right. <laughs> uh, so he's got multiple peppermint references, yeah. uh, which is another, like, there's a lot of just like little details about this crew and especially about Roper uh, that are like super consistent, even if they're like, like totally in the background. Did you notice? I, I bet you didn't, but uh did you notice is a polite or an impolite way of saying i want to tell you what i noticed (laughs) um no i don't think i don't think we've seen it yet in this series but uh you know there's one point where uh dan danny dan's as because roper has to give a nickname to everyone even his fucking kid Uh, you know, is showing off a drawing that he just did, and like they're really impressed by it. Uh, in this uh episode, I noticed that like, you know, they've got their you know super expensive Spanish villa. There's artwork on the walls that I assume is like just you know nearly priceless or whatever. But one of the pictures on one of the walls is like literally like a framed picture of one of Dan's drawings. Like one of his cray- crayon drawings. I know. Yeah. Super Aww. cute. And who. Very cute. Like, I just, I really love people that pay that close attention to detail of story uh. to, to even have something like that in the background. Like just the set decorator even had the note. Like, you know, this guy is proud of his son's drawing abilities. Yeah. Super cute. Really dope. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we got some. Well, we- Let's can are we ready to move over to uh uh what's going on in uh England or uh well yeah I, I was just gonna say the gaslighting of Corky works and Roper offers Pine Corky's job and has him sign the business in his name. Um I, there was just one thing I wanted to point out with that was he's like uh telling him to sign and we're giving you a new identity, Andrew Birch went with the tree thing. So I guess all of the uh, aliases that Pine had were all tree last names or something, but he's got this whole thing like, Oh no, sign it like manly signature, you know, Andrew Birch always in a hurry. And I, and I feel like uh, Roper here is playing to Pine's ego, even though we know we know as the audience, we know Pine is undercover, but I think Birch or, or Roper in his mind, Oh no, I got to get Pine on board. He clearly doesn't want to stay. Let me, let me kind of, uh, you know, butter him up like, yeah, like more manly signature. And then he signs and he's like, welcome to the family. You know, he's, it's kind of like a, you know, um, what would you call it? Like he's, uh, he, he's trying to make him feel more uh, proud of, of what's going on right now. You know, when he's like putting his name in the name of the company that's doing the arms deal. So he would be like the fall guy, you know? So I thought it was kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, fantastic i mean i like i like it uh i guess i i still can't suss out what's going on in roper's mind of how he plans to use Mm -hmm. our character pine i mean i guess you know like he knows enough about him that he's like i mean i guess like from what he knows about him like uh you know he knows that he's like and he tests him a bunch of times remember like he says the police are coming right now they'll be here in a minute yeah, <laughs> and when he doesn't get a reaction, he's like, "Wow, you are cool as a cucumber." You know, he's he's testing him on some levels, right. uh, so he knows what he's got in his pocket is a guy that uh, is facile with assuming multiple identities, mm-hmm. stays absolutely cool under pressure, um, kind of has nothing to lose, right? Um, seems very trustworthy like i could see how he could think like be thinking like may i might have a use for this guy um but i'm not sure what that use is in his mind 
up until the point where he decides, well, I'm going to make this guy the the patsy for my shell company because that thought wouldn't have occurred to him until after, you know, the shade gets thrown on Corky for being right. possibly unreliable and Corky's kind of getting, you know, pushed to the side a little. This is actually, I think, a, maybe I, this is where I want to interject and say, like, especially watching this, this is the second time through on this episode. I fucking really, really like Tom Hollander. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, oh, he, he plays such a good game. He's really good. Like, watching his performance a second time was just even better. And um, so I was like, oh, okay, I got to Google him. Because I've known I've known the name, but I wasn't sure, like, who who is he? So I did a search, and I was like, holy shit. Well, of course. Like, I know him best as, like, the dickhead, like, arch villain from Pirates of the Caribbean. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, the 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 naval commander of the East India company. Right. Uh, in which again, like also he was fantastic, but I think I can be forgiven a little for not recognizing him without the powdered wig. Yeah. Right. It's, yeah. But now that I know that I'm actually painting, like I'm psychically painting the powdered wig and the tricorner hat on him. In every, every time scene. you see him. <laughs> yes, I totally am. <laughs> That's hilarious. Absolutely. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> um, yeah, no, uh, when I found that out too, I was like, oh yeah, it's that guy. That explains why he's so good on screen. Um, so let's do Britain. Yeah, let's, let's follow Let's, let's, let's follow talk Bert. about England. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, the, we actually get to discover who the moles are uh, out of this. Uh, MI6, the, well, the two guys we had met from MI6 uh brings angela's supervisor is he their supervisor who i'm not sure what he does yeah rex yeah rex rex is her boss okay so they bring him in to meet this uh cia agent uh from langley as well as the two guys from mi6 to to wait and and so the 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 op that angela's running is called limpet and um they're trying to convince Rex to give Limpet to MI6. And Rex is like, no. Um, part of the reason why our agency exists. And, and their agency is like an international enforcement agency. And he's basically like, there's a lot of things that fell through the cracks with MI6. And that was the purpose of establishing our department. And our organization is specifically for these type of international crimes. Um, so no... I'm not going to give it to you because we were established specifically because these things fall through the cracks. Um, and uh, it seems like you had a lot you wanted to talk about with this one. Um, it's it's kind of interesting because we get to finally get to see the the moles. Well, I think I can fill in. I, I mean, I think I can fill in some details. Like, so Angela Burr's agency is it's a, it's a law enforcement agency, but it's not strictly intelligent like i don't know drum whole thing is like we want to bring limpet entirely under an intelligence kind of thing and that's also what the lady from the cia is saying and mm-hmm. so remember we were we were asking i and i apologize that i don't remember the guy's name right now but basically uh angela's black ex-boyfriend from the u.s right. kind of guy lover Right. They, they had a romance in the past. It does very much appear so. Yeah. Uh or at least at some point they had the the possibility of one. Um he is uh let's see. Oh yeah, actually I think he's Joel Stedman. Um oh, so he can be Stedman to her Oprah. Uh yeah. <laughs> So yeah, we were talking about like we didn't we weren't a hundred percent clear what agency he worked for. Um, but it's, this is where we find out for sure. It's not the CIA because the CIA lady feels like, you know, I mean, she thinks limpet is the operation is like been railroaded underneath the CIA and that, you know, she's describing it as like, we've got two very fringe departments one American, one British working together on something that really should probably be 
uh, managed at a higher level. Right. Um, but again, like you said, Rex totally sticks to his guns. He says, look, the permanent secretary uh, agreed with me when I pointed out to her that uh, MI6 is overextended, the <laughs> river house. Um, and uh, no, I'm, I'm hanging on to this operation and I'm letting uh, Angela do her shit with Stedman. And then, and then one of the MI6 agents follows him out and uh, offers him a bribe. I thought that was really bold. It was very bold. Yeah. Here's a guy that's entire department is for international crimes, and you've just kind of tipped your hand uh, that you're pretty much working for Roper. <laughs> what did he say? He was like... Yeah, if you give us limpet, you know, you'll have uh, a very distant uncle uh, suddenly die in Switzerland. And and, he's, and Rex is like, I'm going to pretend like I didn't hear that. That was pretty bold as far as I'm concerned. That could get someone in a lot of trouble. Unless you, you start going and making accusations. And they're like, what are you talking about? You're making stuff up. You know, it's, it's his word against his maybe. I don't know, but I, I thought it was pretty bold. Yeah. Um... You know, this is the first time we've done a pure episode by episode uh, miniseries on this podcast, and I'm I'm not sure if we should be doing spoilers or not. I I would suggest no, but if if you want, I, I for the night manager because it's like six episodes. I don't I don't know if it's that big of a deal, but let's I kind of would like. Oh, let's go with no for right now. Uh, right. Let me just let me just kind of suggest that based on something I think we find out later in the series, there was a much easier route for drum ghoul to take than to just nakedly try to bribe uh, Rex into giving over control of the operation. Oh, okay. I see where you're going. Yeah. I'm also not sure that they had, because, you know, we, in the last episode, uh, Angela and Stedman did a really good job, I thought, we thought, of acting like Limpet's got nothing, dude. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, <laughs> like we, we, we're we really, like, we think we've got something, but uh, we're, pr- we're pushing it at you in a way that's going to make you look at what we have and say, like, nah, you ain't got shit. Right. Uh, so... Uh, <laughs> I was never sure what triggered uh, this sudden river house interest in Limpet because the last time we saw drum ghoul, he was like, get the fuck out of here. You guys, you guys are, you guys are losers. Yeah. But later we find uh crap. I forgot the guy's name, but uh, he actually meets with Roper um, and Sandy. And, yes. Uh, so we discover that uh, Roper's reach is pretty large. That's and, when we find uh, out the guy's name, by the way, is drum ghoul, which is ghoul. like a Harry Potter villain name. If I ever, but that guy, him. there's the other guy that actually meets with Roper. What was his name? Well, okay. I, for, I forgot what his See, name was. Here's where I get confused sometimes because there's drum, there's drum ghoul and there's the other guy. And every time I see drum ghoul, I'm like, that guy looks really creepy. And then I see right. the other guy and I'm like, Oh wait, no, <laughs> no, that guy looks creepy. Right. Um, <laughs> like there's there's a there's one of them is like a creepy looking guy like level 2, the other guy's a creepy looking dude level 4. When I when they're not both in the same room, I kind of have difficulty f- telling them apart. Oh, so yeah. yeah, you're right. Maybe it's not maybe it's not drum ghoul, but maybe it's a uh, level 4 creepy guy that met them it's it's that one that that added actually met them okay and um but that's when we discover you know you could infer from drum ghoul's uh bribe attempt and then other guys meeting with roper oh right and, then, and if that wasn't enough then right. and then the right. cia lady right yeah and so now that like you know one of them super creepy guy is meeting directly with roper and sandy now cards are on the table the 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 filmmakers aren't trying to hide it anymore. Uh, something's rotten in the river house. Right. <laughs> and they, and they refer to uh, halo 
in that discussion as a person. Uh, Halo is a person that uh, Roper uh, clearly believes is a guy. Again, and I'm not 100% sure about this. That might not be that might not be correct. So I'm not sure if Roper's ever actually met Halo. Um, yeah, I'm not sure either. But this guy is here to basically say, like, you know, I'm delivering instructions from the person named Halo or information. Um, and, and he's basically, hey, uh, there's an op on you. They don't really have anything, but it's there. Uh, we're doing everything we can, but just so you know, be careful. Um, and then, and then, and then Roper's like, "Oh, we got some intelligence of our own," which was basically that uh, Corky was talking too much, or something. Is 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 that what he was talking about? Or is there some other intelligence that we missed? Uh, I don't specifically remember what it is that uh, the River House source reveals to Roper and Sandy, but I, I think the principle like the point of the scene being there was just to tell us the audience like no it's not your imagination audience angela's <laughs> right not to trust these creepy looking motherfuckers what we, oh that's right the show ends with signing over the business so that's about all i can think of as far as tradecraft goes do you have anything else you wanted to chime in on mm, no i think we nailed it let me let me yeah let me double check your notes. Uh, let's see. Yep, we got it. Episode Perfect. three of the Night Manager. Tell them, tell them, tell them the stuffs. Uh, well, next week we're going to do episode four. Um, but yeah, you can check us out on spieslikeus.net or just search for us, uh, Spies Like Us podcast on any podcast app that you have. And come like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Give us some feedback and uh, let's get we'll some reviews going too, guys. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Hook us up with some reviews. Uh, we'll see you guys next week. All right. Five stars. The preceding transmission sampled the song Enter the Party by Kevin McLeod and sound effects from freesound.org. Attributions and links are found at spieslikeus.net.